Morning, church. So I like to give you guys some scripture each Sunday that is an encouragement. Um, and I have been doing that the last few, few weeks anyway. But this morning I woke up with, with these words in my head, and that is know your sin. Do you know your sin? Do you know what you're doing wrong? Do you know how you're being uh, unpleasing to the Lord? I think all of us, sometimes we look at our sin as it's not that big a deal. You know, it's like, well, it's just who God made me to be. I'm just that way. Well, no, God didn't make you to be a sinful person. His word tells us that we are to be righteous and holy. He says we can be righteous and holy. But that begins with us knowing that we are sinful people. We all have sin. But here's some encouragement for you. <laughs> and I've read this before. It comes from 1 John. It's 1 John 1, 1.9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if you're living a sinful life, you're living in the dark, you feel like you need to justify or make excuses for your sin, I'm going to tell you right now, God's not cool with it. Confess your sin. And he will forgive you. He is faithful and he is just and he will forgive you of your sins. That being said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for this day and we thank you for each one that's here. Lord, we just ask that you have your way in this service today. Pray that the message the pastor brings will be one that we can apply to our lives and that we can share with others. Lord, we pray your blessings over the tithes and offerings that are given, and we ask that they be used to increase your kingdom and that you multiply them. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and unable to be with us this morning. We pray for their healing, and we pray for those who are going through other difficulties and struggles in their lives, Lord. We pray that you will grant them your peace and your understanding, and we ask that for ourselves as well. And Lord, we do want to confess our sins. We want to ask for your forgiveness, and we want to ask for your strength to overcome the temptations and the evils of this world, to guide our thoughts and to guide our, our words and our actions, Lord. We thank you that you are a good and faithful God, that you are, that you are just. As we go through this day, today, Lord, we just pray that you will guide us, protect us, and show us what you'll have us do. We thank you for your love, your kindness, and your mercy, and for all that you provide. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. When he went outside, he, he thought, I better cut some firewood for Ma, so he grabbed the axe and he split some wood, and while he was doing that, the axe bounced and hit against his ankle and it made a little cut, just a band-aid kind of thing, no big deal. Uh, so he didn't worry about it, but uh, it began to fester and get sore and get worse. And what happened is they were homemade socks and the, the blue dye in the yarn poisoned him through that little nick in his skin. And so uh, it was treatable. He, he recovered, but... Uh, the doctor, as he treated it, he said, um, I don't think you better leave town. You better stick around so I can keep an eye on you. And so his friends went, and he stayed, and he didn't have anything to do. And someone asked him to go to church. They were having meetings at their church all week. And so he went, and he gave his heart to Jesus. Amen. And he was baptized. And when he got the, into the Lord, when the Lord came into his life, he saw it. What am I going to do with myself? How, what am I going to do with my life? I'm 19 years old. And he felt like he should go to college so that he would have more ways that he could do whatever God wanted. So he went to college and he got out of that and he began preaching and people came and he, he preached, I don't know how many years. And then he ran for Congress and he was elected nine times. So he spent 18 years 
in the House of Representatives in Washington. And then to everyone's surprise, he was elected as the 20th president of the United States. James Garfield. Now, you probably don't know much about him. He's not one of the famous ones. He, he didn't win any wars or any of those things, but he was a faithful servant of God. Amen. And he had no idea one morning when he got up and thought, oh, I'll put these socks on, that it would change his life, that it would set into action a course of events that would lead to things he never would have dreamed. But it happened. And that, that dear lady, maybe it was one of his aunts, had no idea when she bought that blue yarn that the dye in it would be poisonous if you cut yourself while you were wearing those socks. But she made the socks and she decided to give them to Jim and, and the pastor decided to preach on that text and uh, someone in town decided to ask him to, to go to church with them. They had no idea, did they? But God did. God is always working and he's using details to bring his plan into action. And we see it in the Bible. We see it. And uh, there's a book in the Bible that never mentions God's name. But we learn about God in it dramatically. It's the book of Esther. One of the things we learn from the book of Esther is that God is in charge of everything. He really is. And it's called sovereignty. Sovereignty means you're in charge. You don't answer to anyone else. Anyone else answers to you. And God is sovereign totally of everything. He's sovereign of all the sovereigns. He's in charge of your boss. He's in charge of the president. He's in charge of everybody, everything, in heaven and in earth. He's sovereign. In fact, the Bible says he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand. I think in this context, the powers of heaven are demonic and angelic and all the spiritual things going on. And God says, there isn't anything anywhere that can stop me or can uh, make me do something. I'm in charge all the time of every detail. And the second thing beyond sovereignty is that God supplies everything we need to do as well. And that's called providence. When you see the word providence, it's got the word provide in it. And God says, I will take care of your needs. I will set you up to succeed when you set out to do my will. I'll give you what you need. I'll provide it. And uh, he's never caught by surprise. He knows what's coming. He's never unprepared. He's never unwilling to meet our needs. Even, I like this because I can relate, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. God says you're never going to be on your own. It's never just going to be your resources. It's never going to be all up to you. I'm the one who's going to make things happen in your life. And he did that with James Garfield. He did that with Esther. We're going to see it. The story of Esther is an example that comes out of history. About 500 years before Jesus was born, about 500 years after King David and King Solomon, there was an empire called the Persian Empire. You can see it was vast. It went all the way from the border of India all the way across Europe to the Mediterranean Sea, down into Africa, and up even into part of Europe. And it included Israel. And uh, it included millions of people. And the king of Persia, when he spoke, it was law for every person in that entire area. Once they threw a party, it lasted 180 days. If we started a party like that today, it would go until March 1st. It was a party. He invited thousands of his officials. The men had their party separate from the women. And uh, they had plenty to eat and drink. And when the men were drinking their wine and getting uh, uh, 
you know, just kind of having a good time, the king said, I'm going to bring in my queen, Queen Vashti, and show you how beautiful she is. Now, I don't know what exactly he had in mind with that, but she said, no, I'm not going in front of a bunch of drunk guys and showing off my beauty, however you want me to do that. She said no. She said no to the guy whose word ruled a major part of the world, who was called the king of kings. She said no to him. He never expected that. It stunned him. It, it made him mad. And it humiliated him in front of all these people. So he gave it a little thought, talked it over with some friends, said, I'm going to banish her. She's not queen anymore. I'm going to get a different queen. And it was sort of like a beauty contest. They brought in women from different parts of the empire. They had to be beautiful. They had to be intelligent. They had to look like a queen and act like a queen. And the king would decide which one he would actually make the queen. I'm not sure exactly how it happened, and I'm not sure how it happened that Esther became part of it, but Esther was a, a, little, a, a young woman. She might have still been a teenager, probably was. And uh, she'd been orphaned as a little girl and raised by a cousin who was her guardian. And her name was actually Hadassah, but she went by Esther because that was a Persian name. And um, she was selected to be in this thing. And so she was taken to the palace. She was given all kinds of beauty treatments and instruction and, and then she went to the king and he picked her out of all the women and she became the queen. Her guardian named Mordecai encouraged her when she was taken to the palace, don't tell people your nationality, just keep that to yourself. She was Jewish and so she didn't tell anybody and uh, she, she relied on him. He was uh, someone who had been her teacher all her life and, and so they kept in touch through messengers and one day she got a message from Mordecai that was urgent. Mordecai had overheard two of the king's officials talking in the palace about killing the king. They were planning an assassination and they didn't know he heard them but he reported all the details to Esther and she alerted the king, and he checked into it, and the investigation showed that it was true. And so the, the men plotting his death were put to death, and it was all recorded. They kept a log of all the events of the kingdom, and it was recorded in that chronicle, and then forgotten. Well, not by God, but by everybody else, it seems. In the meantime, the king had his eye on someone else, uh, a man who he trusted to be his number one counselor, his top official. His name was Haman. And Haman uh, was chosen to be like the prime minister. And Haman liked that idea. Haman, Haman was great in his own eyes. And he wanted people to recognize that. And so when he went through the streets, he had a messenger go ahead and tell people, bow down, Haman is coming. They had to do that for the king, but Haman said they should do it for the king's number one, too. And so people had to bow down when he came by. And one day he noticed there was someone standing off to the side who didn't bow down. He showed respect. He bowed his head. He, he showed respect, but he didn't drop to his knees. And that infuriated Haman. That was a slight. That was disrespect. That was not acceptable. And so he told some servants to find out who that was. Turned out he was a government official. He worked in a little, little office somewhere around the palace. and His name was Mordecai. He was Jewish. See, in Hebrew, the, the word for worship is the same word as to fall down or to bow down. You drop to your knees and you bring your head forward to the ground. And that's the word for worship. That's what the Bible says. That's what the word the Bible uses when it says you shall not worship any idol. In fact, the Bible tells us you won't worship anyone but God. 
You don't worship anyone with God. You show respect. You, you give obedience. You, you do the right thing. But God alone stands out as the one that we worship. And when Haman found out it was a Jew, it stirred something in him because he hated Jews. For over 500 years, his people had hated the Jewish people, hated them, wanted to annihilate them. And he saw his opportunity. The word Haman is only different from the word Hamas by the last letter. Haman, Hamas, same mentality, same goal, same source of hate. The devil has hated God from the beginning and he's hated everything God stands for and everything God does. And so the devil has hated the Jews since God told Abraham, I will make you a great nation and you will be my chosen people. And it's still going on today. It happened this week. Six hostages. The Israeli army was just about to get there and deliver them and Hamas executed them, killed them. They weren't going to let him live. That hatred, that unexplainable cruelty comes from the devil. People need prayer when they're caught in anything from the devil, right? Well, Haman decided that he would uh, get the king's approval, so he, he got his story together and he went to the king. He said, you have some people in your kingdom who are dangerous, they, they aren't easily ruled. In fact, they, they, they will think for themselves and they will do what they think is right no matter what you say. You will never have control of them the way you ought to. They need to be eliminated. They need to be gotten rid of. They're dangerous and they're wrong and they won't change. And he said, I'll tell you what, king, if we, you let me uh, take care of this, I will take their property. I'll bring millions of dollars into the royal treasury. The king thought, well, some money, get rid of troublemakers. Okay, go ahead, Haman, do whatever you want. Uh, Haman had a ring that had a seal. He could do something, and it was, it was the same as if the king said it. And so he got his permission, he got together with some friends, feeling really good about this, said, let's pick a day when we just get the Jews killed. And they threw the dice. They were called Purim. They threw the dice, they picked the day, it turned out eight months away. He said, okay, they sent out messengers to every part of the kingdom in all these different languages. He said, on this particular day, anyone who wants to can kill any Jew and take his property. Somehow some of that would trickle back to the king, but you could kill any, any Jew, you could take anything they owned, you could kill the whole family. There was no, no trial, no limits, nothing. All of a sudden, the Jews had no place to go. The entire empire was a hunting ground. They had no recourse. People came up to them at work. Hey, you're Jewish, aren't you? Let's see. 62 more days. I'm killing you. I'm going to slash your kids' throats. I'm taking your big screen TV. Work some overtime and buy yourself something that I can have. Neighbors, co workers, taunting, prideful. going to be three against one at your house. Better be saying your prayers. The Jews were humiliated. They were devastated. They were scared. They were in a panic. They, they didn't know what to do. Mordecai put ashes on his head, cold ashes, but they, they would put ashes on their head to show how sorrowful they were, how defeated they were. They, they would wear burlap, sackcloth against their skin to show that they felt hopeless, that they were in misery. And Esther heard that he was 
doing that, and she sent a messenger and said, Mordecai, take a shower and put on some nice clothes. What's wrong? He said, I cannot change how I look because I cannot change how I feel. Didn't you hear? We need to go to the king and get him to change this. Now, the law of the Medes and the Persians was that when the king said something, it became law, and it could not be erased. You couldn't take it back off. You could add to it, but you couldn't subtract. He said, we've got to get the king to say something so the Jews won't all be annihilated. You and I are part of that. There's no escape for you in the palace. She said, what am I supposed to do? He said, you're the only Jew who has access to the king. Nobody else talks directly to him on any basis. You're the only one. You need to go and talk to him. She said, I can't. Only if you're summoned can you talk to the king. You can't just walk in and say, hey, king, hey, honey, how are you today? You cannot talk to the king unless he asks you to come, even the queen. And the rule was, if you walked into the throne room and you had not been summoned or asked, you would be put to death right there. The only exception would be if the king extended his scepter and smiled at you and said, hey, then you would, you would be welcomed. But there's no guarantee of that. In fact, it would make the king look weak if he did that too much. And everyone remembered Queen Vashti. It had been six years, but no one forgot. Esther certainly remembered. It was the same king. He doesn't want to be humiliated again by his wife. And that's when Mordecai said to her, Esther, you need to do this. Who knows but that you have been given your royal position for such a time as this. Why do you think you're in the palace? Why do you think you're called queen? Why do you think he picked you? God put you there. God puts everybody somewhere. Your job, God set it up. Your family, your place in the neighborhood, the people who moved in next door, the kids that cut through your yard. God put you where you are. He put you where you are on any given day. You go to a restaurant and this is your server today. God may have a major reason for that. And if he doesn't have a major reason, he has a little reason because he, you belong to him and you can encourage her. You can be kind to someone who may be going through something really hard right now. <clears throat> Everything in our life, God cares about. And it matters to him. And there's an opportunity in it. And those profound words remind us, we're not here by accident. We're not anywhere by accident. And God always has a purpose. And so Esther agreed to try. She said, Mordecai, fast. Get your Jewish people together and fast. Three days. I'm going to fast here. I'm not going to eat. My, my gals, my waiting staff, the people that take care of me, they're going to fast. It doesn't say they're going to pray, but fasting and prayer go together in the scriptures always. And so there must have been intense prayer going on in the palace and in the city. And after three days, she said, I'll go. She said, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I must die for doing it, I will die. In the King James Bible, it says, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do the right thing no matter what happens. I'm going to do the right thing even though I may be fired. I'm going to do the right thing even though I may go broke. I'm going to do the right thing even though I may get sick. 
I'm going to do the right thing even though I may not be liked. I'm going to do the right thing because it's God's will. That's what he put me here to do. I'm going to do what God wants. I'm not going to let the consequences affect me. Does that apply to anybody besides Esther? And so she, she was smart. She put on her nicest clothes, her best perfume, had her hair done just right. She looked good that day. She knew what the king liked. She knew what color he liked, what jewelry he liked. And then deliberately, not defiantly, but deliberately, she walked into the throne room. I'm sure there was someone standing guard at the door who said, did he ask for you? She said, you need to step aside, I'm going in. And of course he would. But as soon as she stepped into that room, well, it's been a huge place, I don't think you would have heard a word. Quiet. Eyes bouncing from her to him. What's going to happen? Someone asking, did you ask her to come? Was this part of the schedule today? Is, is she supposed to be here? The king's as surprised as anybody. This does not happen. And Esther waits. She doesn't have to wait long. He smiles. He points his scepter. He's thinking to himself, there must be something going on with her today. I better find out what it is. What is it, Esther? What do you need? She said, I just would like you to come and have lunch in my apartment. Bring Haman. That's it? I'll tell you more. Okay, Haman, noon, you and me. They come, they have a nice lunch. She knows what he likes. She knows the seasonings. There's music. Everything's perfect. He says, what is it now? Tell me your request. This is kind of weird. She says, well, would you come back tomorrow for lunch? One more time. I'll tell you everything tomorrow, but would you come back tomorrow and, and bring Haman? Now she's kind of stretching him a little bit, but he's, he likes her. He, he says, sure, we can do that, can't we, Haman? She has no idea. She could not possibly know what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. There's no way she knows the future. But God does. And God is working. And God is in it. And God sets it up. And Haman was feeling pretty good when he left that day. I'm coming back to the palace tomorrow, and of all the people in the kingdom, I'm the only one who's going to have lunch with the king and the queen. And they're going to talk about something, I don't know what it is, but they're going to talk about something pretty important, at least to her. And I get to be part of it. I am somebody. I've gotten somewhere in my life. And he goes home, and his wife is there. He's got a few friends. And he says, man, he says, I, I can't believe how great my life is. I, I'm going back tomorrow. And I'm the only one. Everything's perfect, ah, except for that stupid Mordecai. Won't bow down, that jerk. They said, why do you put up with him? You don't have to let something annoy you day after day. Just get rid of him. He says, yeah, I'm going to. He has a gallows built in his own yard. It's 75 feet tall, probably twice as far as the ceiling. He says, the only thing I, I got to have the king's approval, kill somebody in any place in the government. So I'll go in first thing in the morning, I'll get approval, and I'll have him dead before breakfast. That's Haman's plan. It's not God's plan. Guess who wins? That night, the king can't sleep. I don't know if that happened a lot or not, but he just could not sleep. He just did not have any peace, any rest. He finally thought, I got to get someone to bore me to sleep. And so he 
calls a servant. He says, read to me from the Chronicles, from the log book. Tell, read something from my nine years as king that's written in our little history record. There, there are books that are written today to put you to sleep. The, the, you can buy them on tape or get them on your phone. And, and they give long, meaningless descriptions of the landscape and of different things. There's no action. There's no plot. There's no, you know, there's very little. It, they're just designed to, for you to just tune out and go to sleep. I once in a while get a call. Pastor, I cannot sleep. Would you preach a few minutes? I did make that up, but it, it probably would work. But the king is expecting to fall asleep, and he doesn't. What he does here is about the time someone tried to assassinate him, and this fellow Mordecai got warning to him, and he, was, uh, he escaped. And justice was done. And he doesn't. He's never met Mordecai. He says, what, what did we do for him? And it says, there, there's nothing here. He, he wasn't rewarded at all. The king says, well, that doesn't seem right. I got, he, I'm alive because of him. We got to reward him. I want to do something first thing. So instead of sleeping, he's kind of pondering, how can I reward this guy who has, you know, saved me? And, and God is working, isn't he? And why did they pick that little spot out of nine years of records? God was in it. God saw to it. And so early in the morning, the king hasn't slept. He's ready for the day. He's in his, his uh, whatever, his office, his throne room, and, and um, there's servants around him always. And he says, who's, who's out in the waiting room? Who, who's, who's here to see me today? And they said, just Haman. Oh, good. Send Haman in. Why Haman? Well, he was there to get rid of the guy he hated. So Haman comes in, and before he can ask for permission to kill Mordecai, the king says, Haman, how should I reward somebody who's done something very important for me? How should I show the people in this kingdom how much I value the loyalty of a good servant, of a faithful man? And Haman's thinking to himself, well, who would he want to reward more than me? Guys, you got to give him credit for his humility. He's very consistent. Well, king, and he's thinking, what would I like? How about this? Take one of your royal robes and put it on the guy. Take one of your royal horses that, that you ride and have him get on it. And take one of your uh, most important officials and have him lead that horse through the busy streets downtown and shout out to people, this is how the king honors someone who's valuable to him. And he's very pleased when the king nods his head and says, Haman, you nailed it. That's good. I like that plan. We're going to do it. Haman, you get it going right now. You personally take care of it for Mordecai. That was a stress test right there. The guy I came to get killed... I have to honor publicly? Yeah. He's thinking it. He's not saying it. He's doing it because he has to. He's getting through it. But as soon as he can say, I think that's enough, he gets out of there and he goes home and he's humiliated. He's defeated. All the good things he thought about himself have been reduced to ashes. And he tells his wife, and she says, I, I don't think it's over yet, honey, if that's how it's going. Well, thanks. And it wasn't over. God wasn't done yet. God was still doing things. And then a servant knocks on the door and says, the king and queen are expecting you for lunch. He quick hurries to the palace. It's not as pleasant as yesterday, but he's there. and They eat. Oh, man, the king liked it. She says, now, he says, honey, what is it that you need? Up to half my kingdom, whatever you want. She says, all I'm asking is that you don't let anyone kill me. Huh? 
don't let them kill me and my people. He says, who would try to kill you and your people? She says, that man right there, that wicked man, Haman. They're stunned. King is stunned. Haman's stunned. They didn't see this coming. I don't know if the king immediately realized, oh, she's, talk she's talking about the Jewish people. I remember, I don't know if he put it together instantly or it took him a minute, but he was a, he was a capable ruler and he had learned to take a little time. So he stepped back. He actually stepped out of the room. He stepped out into the garden to think, what is going on? What am I supposed to do? Haman, filled with panic. Oh, man, after what happened that morning, he didn't know what to expect. He's scared. The guy who wanted to kill hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Jews, he's scared. Esther, you know, the, the tables were about this far off the ground. You laid on your side when you ate, and, and she's down at the table, and he comes over, and he collapses by her on the couch there, and he's pleading with her, please, don't tell the king I didn't mean anything. Tell the, you know, don't let him kill me. The king walks in, and it looks like his, his, his top man is on top of his wife. And he says, you're going to molest her in the palace while I'm here? And he just blows up. You know how anger can just... It happened. And even God was in that. And a guy as proud as Haman must have offended a lot of people along the way. And there's some servant in the room who speaks up. He says, you know, king, Haman has a gallows in his yard. He built it yesterday. He planned to hang Mordecai on it today. Well, that's really helpful. And he sets the king up, of course, and the king says, well, you hang him on it now. And so Haman is dragged away, taken home, hung on the gallows that he built, and the king says to Esther, now tell me what's going on. And she explains the Jewish people and the plot that Haman had. And he says, well, what should I do about it? She says, well, my, my guardian, Mordecai, uh, he would have some good ideas. He's a very br brilliant man. He's very loyal. You know he's loyal. You just rewarded him this morning. And he says, yeah, bring him in. He takes the ring that he had taken off Haman's hand and he puts it on Mordecai and he says, you're my top man now. By the way, you own all the property of Haman and you have all the authority Haman had. What, you, what should I do about this mess that I was part of? And he says, well, we, we can't subtract, but we can add. I want you to make a rule that we can tell the Jews they are allowed to defend themselves. They're allowed to take the initiative against their enemies and they're allowed to kill anyone who has threatened them or who, and to take their property. Now, all these people who, who were taunting the Jews for the last few months, 14 more days, pal, <laughs> and uh, your house will be mine. Your family will be dead. I'm taking a cruise with your savings. All of a sudden, those people who had exposed their anger and hatred for the Jews were the vulnerable ones. On the appointed day, the day of the Purim, the dice, the Jews did attack their known enemies and they did kill. They did not take property, but they defended themselves from people who had made it known that they planned to kill them. It was 2,500 years ago. <clears throat> and every spring, the Jews remember it and celebrate it. They had a party that first time. And they've had a party every year since then on that day of the year. Comes in the spring, a little before Easter usually. We were in Israel when they had it. They were dancing. We looked out of the motel. 
and they were dancing down in the, in the streets, making these circle dances, you know how they do, and they, the kids were all dressed up like on Halloween, except they were fun costumes. And there were special pastries in the, in the bakery. Uh, one was called Haman's Ears. They were triangular shaped, like elephant ears, you know, they were just something good to eat. They had special treats for that time of year. Every year, for 2,500 years, they've celebrated that God took us from the point of extinction to giving us safety and even power. Because the people who had planned to kill the Jews, they knew that the top guy in the government, besides the king, was a Jew. God was in all of it. He wasn't done. He set it up. He made it happen. The tables turned because God arranged it. And he took care of everything. The Bible says our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. And he still does. Now you ought to vote in the election. It's your duty as a citizen and as a Christian. You ought to do your duty. But we're not going to pick. We're not going to have the last voice. God does. I still remember I was a young man or a young kid when LBJ, President Johnson, said I'm not running for another term. And I still remember that he didn't live till the end of that term. He didn't run, and if he had been elected, he wouldn't have finished. I remember making a mental note. God, you must have known that. Of course he did. He knows everything, and he's working, and he's working in your life. Your boss doesn't have the last word. Your neighbor doesn't have the last word. Somebody who sues you doesn't have the last word. The mayor or the governor or the president does not have the last word. God does. He always does in your life. For 76 years, the, the, the Arab countries, there are 22 Arab countries in the Middle East, there's one Jewish country. From the very first day that they became a nation, many of the Arabs, not all of them, many of the Arabs said, we're going to drive you into the sea. We're going to be a bulldozer. We're going to sweep you and all your stuff and all your people and your kids. We're going to push you into the ocean, into the Mediterranean Sea, and you're gone. And they're still trying it. But they don't get to do it. Because God raised up a nation. He doesn't fight their battles for them, but he fights their battles with them. They don't do everything right, but God protects them because he said he would. And we ought to give ourselves to God because we belong to him. At least we can. We may not have a strategic role like Esther that will affect millions of people and be remembered for thousands of years, but we have a place in God's plan that matters. And you may make a difference in one life. There may be someone in heaven forever because you became their friend. Because you shared a scripture or a tract or invited them to a service like James Garfield. You, you may change someone's life by just being at the place you are, at the time you are, for God. Two verses I want to read. The Lord frustrates the purposes of the nations the evil purposes. He keeps them from carrying out their evil plans. But his plans endure forever. His purposes last till next week. Is that what it says? Eternally. God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. We're going to have communion. I'm going to ask the servers to come and serve it. And while you're being given the bread and the cup, we're going to uh, watch a video of that song we sang just before the message. We're going to repeat it because it's important. And we're going to ask God to drill it home in our hearts. So watch this prayerfully, will you? And thanks, guys. Go ahead.
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, smile on you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.